An Air for Christmas A Christmas on Palmer Island Romance Written by Suzanne Ash Chapter 1 You bring this up over Thanksgiving dinner? Ryan put down his fork and looked at his grandfather, the turkey had gone dry in his mouth. My patience is running out. You've known about my wishes since January. I'm getting too old to deal with the resort business. It's time for me to retire, and for you to settle down and start a family of your own. Joseph Beckheim had always been a no-nonsense guy, and he was stubborn to the core. It was this strength of will that had allowed him to build a multi-location resort company. They now owned and operated some of the most popular hotels throughout the southeastern United States and the Caribbean. At 72, he was in surprisingly good shape. Ryan didn't mind that his grandfather was ready to move on to the next phase of his life. He was ready to replace Grandpa Joe as head of the company. If only the old man hadn't gotten it into his head that Ryan needed to find a wife and produce an heir first. I don't see why I need to get married for you to retire. We've talked about this, Grandpa Joe said. Beckheim Resorts will only stay a family company if there is another generation to pass it on to. We lost your father. That means you're it, boy. He picked up his glass and leaned back in his chair. I've had my lawyers adjust the contract. You don't have to be married to take over. I'm doing my best to be open-minded and there are lots of couples out there raising children out of wedlock. I don't understand it, but if that's what it takes, so be it. He paused. Ryan looked up from his plate and watched the old man sit up straight and square his shoulders. Here's the deal. If you don't have offspring on the way by the end of the year, I'm selling to Peterman. You've had 11 months. It's not like this is coming as a big surprise, so don't look so astonished, Grandpa Joe started piling another helping of cornbread dressing on his plate before drowning it in turkey gravy. You've had 11 months. The words were still ringing through Ryan's mind when he left the luxurious suite his grandfather occupied at the ancient Mariner Hotel and Resort on Palmer Island. He got in his car and drove halfway across the island to Rosie's. It was the kind of place he'd spent quite a bit of time at, in the years following his parents' death. The music was loud, the beer was cold, and despite the fact that this was Thanksgiving, it was packed. It was the perfect place to lose yourself and drown your sorrows. Ryan, over here, Patrick waved him over to the table near the back. It was their usual hangout. Out of the way, but close enough to the dartboard and pool table. Max and Nolan were engrossed in a game of pool and hadn't seen him come in. After making a beeline for the bar to pick up a round of beers, Ryan joined his friends. Friends was a bit of an exaggeration. His drinking buddies was more like it. Until a few months ago, he'd traveled across the world with guys like these three, and of course his best friend Pete. And then Pete had gone and married some girl named Caroline. What's happening? Ryan asked, putting four beer bottles on the grimy table in front of him. Thanks. You look like you need this more than I do. Everything okay? Patrick picked up one of the chilled bottles and took a deep swig. Same old, same old. Grandpa Joe is ready to retire, but wants to see me settled first. Ryan finished half of his own beer before setting it back down. That old man needs to get a grip. It's the 21st century. You're ready to take over, and he can go spend his golden years fishing or playing golf or whatever it is these old geezers do. Watch it. The old man is my family. Patrick put up his hands. No hard feelings. Grandpa Joe is a good guy. I'm not sure why you're so eager to take over for him. I wouldn't want the job. Ryan shrugged. It's something to do. He had a hard time picturing his grandfather retired, but the old man deserved to take it easy. The past decade had hit him hard and Ryan hadn't made his life easier. Joe Beckheim had been ready to hand the company reins over to Ryan's father, but then the plane crash had put an end to those plans. Ryan's parents had been on their way back from Bermuda in the company jet when it crashed somewhere over the ocean. Only bits and pieces of the plane were found and the graveyard on Palmer Island held two empty coffins. 
Ryan shook his head. This train of thought wasn't doing him any good. Bad enough, he'd spent close to a decade running away from the pain and family obligation. It was time to man up and give Grandpa Joe a much-deserved break. If only the old man wouldn't insist on this family legacy stuff. Ryan wasn't even 30 yet. He had plenty of time to think about marriage and kids. The deadline was a pain in the neck. He wasn't ready for anything more than a casual date or a quick hookup. It's why he had spent much of the year avoiding thinking about it. He'd blow off some steam tonight and talk some sense into Grandpa Joe in the morning. He wasn't really going to let him sell to Peterman. No way. Sarah slid open the glass door and stepped out onto the back deck. The morning sun made the ocean sparkle and she could taste the salt in the air. She took a deep breath and soaked in the view. Her great aunt's place was one of the few old beach houses left on Palmer Island. During the summer months, the beach was full of tourists swimming and sunbathing. This time of the year it was much quieter. Sarah could hear the seagulls squawking and the waves crashing on the shore. A few people were walking down the beach. She saw an older woman combing the beach for shells and a couple walking their dog. You look tired, honey. Aunt Doris pulled out a chair and handed Sarah a mug of coffee. She had always loved it here. The best part of her great aunt's house was the back deck overlooking the dunes and the ocean. Sarah could lose herself in the views, the ocean breeze blowing through her hair and the sound of the waves soothing her soul. Thank you, Aunt Doris. Sarah took a cautious sip of the hot brew. It was strong and sweet. Just how she liked it. These last few weeks are hard, but wait until you hold that sweet little baby in your arms. It will all have been worth it, Aunt Dora said. Sarah nodded and kept drinking her coffee. As the waves were crashing onto the beach, she thought about the baby growing inside her. Was she ready to be a mother? She wasn't sure. Raising a child by yourself was a tough job. She'd grown up with a single mom who worked two jobs to keep food on the table. It hadn't been easy. It's why she couldn't get mad at her mom for wishing for a different life for her daughter. It would have been nice to have her help and support though. At least she had her great aunt who had welcomed her into this beautiful home with a beachfront view after her mom had kicked her out. Have you heard anything from Marianne? Aunt Doris must have been reading her mind. Sarah shook her head. Don't let it bother you. She'll come around. Once the baby is born, she won't be able to stay away. I know my niece. You should have seen her when she had you. You were the apple of her eye. And even if she doesn't, you know you'll always have a home here. Lucky for you, I'm a pretty good babysitter. Aunt Doris smiled with those dark eyes surrounded by laugh lines. Sarah didn't know what she would have done if her great aunt hadn't taken her in. We'll see. She's worried and stubborn, but she has a point. I don't know if I can do this by myself. You know what it was like for mom and me when I was little. Money was always tight, and there were times when I hardly ever saw her. I don't want that kind of life for my child. What if I can't give this baby everything it deserves? Sarah asked herself for the hundredth time if she should consider putting the baby up for adoption. She hated the thought of losing her child, but wouldn't it be for the best? Aunt Doris rose and walked over to give Sarah a hug. It'll all work out. Try not to worry so much. She paused and stepped back, looking Sarah over. I know what you need. A little fresh air and a bit of a distraction. Why don't you drive over to Main Street for me and pick up a couple of things? I'll go make a list. With that the old woman turned and walked inside. Maybe a trip into town would do Sarah good. She used the table and the arm of the chair she'd been sitting in for leverage to push herself up. Eight months into her pregnancy, getting up was one of the many challenges she faced. Sarah stepped out of the flower shop and was heading up the street to pick up a pound of shrimp for dinner. The errand trip had been just what she needed to end her little pity party. Maybe she should stop at the bakery on the way back and pick up a little something for Aunt Doris. The woman loved pastries and cakes more than anyone else she knew. 
Sarah smiled at the thought and started walking toward the seafood market and the small bakery next door to it. She'd barely taken three steps when, a tall man stumbled into her. She dropped the flowers and put out her arms to break the fall. It never came. Instead, strong arms enveloped her and kept her from hitting the pavement. Sarah looked up and found herself staring into the most beautiful green eyes with just a hint of brown in them. Eyes she'd seen before. Eyes she would never forget and had not expected to ever see again. Are you okay? I'm so sorry I bumped into you. It was Ryan. He looked a little pale, but it was him without a doubt. Sarah was too stunned to speak. I'm Ryan, Ryan Beckheim. I'm Sarah. She stuck her hand out automatically, and Ryan shook it. He looked at her for a long moment and Sarah held her breath. I live right up there. He spun around and pointed at a set of windows in the building next to the flower shop. Uff, that was a mistake. He put a hand up to his head, covering his eyes. Sorry. Hang over. Give me a sec. He didn't recognize her. Sure, she'd changed her hair, gained 40 pounds and was growing a baby inside her, but shouldn't he recognize her? Sarah felt a little dizzy and grabbed his arm to steady herself. Would you like to come in and sit down for a minute, he asked. Sarah nodded. She needed a few minutes to get her wits together before Ryan vanished again like he had done after that night in Aruba. He led her up a flight of stairs to a large condo that overlooked Main Street. This was without a doubt a bachelor pad. It was nicely furnished, but messy. Discarded clothes were draped over the couch, paperwork scattered over the coffee table, and the sink was stacked with dirty dishes. Ryan grabbed a handful of clothes from one of the leather chairs and gestured for her to sit. He vanished into what she assumed was the bedroom and returned a moment later. Can I get you something to drink? Water? Coffee? I might have some juice too, let me check. Ryan walked past her into the kitchen. Unlike the dark furniture in the living room area, everything was bright and cheery with stainless steel appliances, white cabinets and light-colored marble countertops. From her current vantage point in the living room, everything in the kitchen looked neat and tidy. She wondered if he did much cooking. Water would be great. Thank you. Sarah scooched a little deeper into the chair. Her back was aching from the walk along Main Street. At least she hoped that's all it was. The last thing she needed was to go into labor the moment she'd bumped into Ryan. That's when it hit her. He had no idea that she was carrying their child. His child. Sarah accepted the glass of water and took a big gulp. It was cool and refreshing. She felt herself relax. It also gave her a few seconds to contemplate telling him he was about to become a father. You look pretty pale. Would you like me to call a doctor? Do you have someone? I can give my physician a call. I'm sure he'd be happy to come over. Ryan had his cell phone out, ready to dial before he finished his rambling. I think I'm fine. No need to call 911. Sarah smiled and hoped the small joke would diffuse some of the tension. He didn't look convinced. Really? I'm just a bit tired. It's hard to sleep through the night these days. He looked relieved and put his phone back in his pocket. Can I get you something to eat? I might have some cheese and crackers around here somewhere. Other than that I think your options are dry cereal or tortilla chips, Ryan said. I think I'm good. Sarah laughed. She took a deep breath and decided to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. You don't remember me, do you? Aruba? In March? That's Sarah. Of course. I can't believe I didn't recognize you. I thought there was something familiar about you. I'm a little foggy this morning. Rough night. Ryan shrugged. Yeah, you look a little hungover. I should get out of your hair and let you recover, said Sarah. She wasn't sure if this was the time to tell him about the baby. Now that they were staying in the same town, there was no need to rush. Right? She started to rise from the chair. 
Ouch. The baby kicked her hard enough in the ribs to take her breath away. She flopped back in the chair, needing to rest for a moment before heading out. When are you due? Ryan asked. Around Christmas. Sarah held her breath and wondered if he'd make the connection. Ryan nodded. That's coming up quick. I'm sure you can't wait. He didn't, but this was as good a time as any to let the cat out of the bag. Listen, this probably isn't the best time to bring this up, but I had no idea how to find you after Aruba. I didn't know your last name until today. She inhaled deeply, trying to calm her nerves enough to keep going. Her heart was beating out of her chest. What about Aruba? We had a great time, didn't we? Ryan looked confused. We did. Unfortunately, that night had consequences neither one of us had counted on. She gently patted her stomach. The baby kicked again in response. Thankfully, this time the kick was less well placed. Settle down, little one. Sarah moved around in the chair, trying to get more comfortable. She couldn't find a good position and started to push herself up. Ryan rushed over and offered her a hand. The sweet gesture brought tears to her eyes. Stupid pregnancy hormones. They had her weeping at diaper commercials, and now this. The confusion she saw on his face wasn't helping. Thanks, she said before starting to pace through the living area. I know this is a lot to take in. I'm sorry to dump this on you, but I thought you deserved to know. I'm planning on raising him, or her, on my own. And I'm not coming after child support, so don't worry. I just wanted you to know. Sarah shrugged, too anxious to look at him. She wasn't sure she was ready for his reaction. Heck, she wasn't sure what reaction she hoped for. Okay, Ryan said. She looked up. All color had gone from his face. He stood there, then plopped down in the chair he'd helped her out of a minute ago. Why didn't you tell me, he asked. How? I tried to find you the morning after, she trailed off. I asked about you at the front desk. The receptionist told me you had checked out. I didn't find out I was pregnant until a few weeks later when I was back home. How was I supposed to find you? Sorry about that. Somebody's came by after I dropped you off at your room and we ended up flying out to Hawaii, Ryan said. He looked even more pale than he had earlier. I had no idea our night together had consequences. But that's beside the point. I shouldn't have left without talking to you first, or at least leaving you a message and a way to contact me. I haven't been the most responsible guy. I'm working on changing that though. No more running around with the boys and partying all night for me. Not that I expect you to believe me or anything. What I'm trying to say is that I would like to spend some time with you, get to know you. Really, would that be okay? Sarah was surprised to find that she liked the idea. She'd been disappointed that morning in Aruba. A few weeks later, when those two purple lines showed up on the pregnancy test, she'd been mad. Mad that she knew nothing about him aside from his first name. Mad that she had no way of contacting him. When she'd lost her scholarship and her mom kicked her out of her childhood home, she'd been angry about having to deal with everything herself. But something had changed during the time she'd spent with Aunt Doris. She had come to terms with what had happened and realized that while they were both responsible for this pregnancy, neither of them was to blame for the situation she found herself in. Sarah hadn't asked him for his phone number or even his last name. She couldn't fault him for not trying to track her down. Over the past few months, she'd made peace with the fact that she would likely never see him again and she'd forgiven him and herself for what happened in Aruba. And here he was, sitting in front of her, and she was as attracted to him as she'd been that day eight months ago. She would have to work hard to not get her hopes up. She'd liked Ryan then, and she liked him even better in the half an hour they'd spent together so far. And then there was the fact that they would soon have a child together. Didn't she owe it to him and their baby to at least spend some time getting to know him better? What did you have in mind, she asked. How about coffee tomorrow? Ryan asked. Sarah nodded. 
coffee would be a good start. Chapter 2. You're going to be a father. Grandpa Joe sounded pleased. His grandfather's reaction surprised Ryan. He figured the older man would at least question how he'd so conveniently managed to present a future heir, just a few days after their last conversation. They were having breakfast on the terrace of his grandfather's penthouse suite. Ryan took a bite of his croissant. He barely noticed the warm and buttery taste. One of the perks of living at the resort was access to the on-property restaurants and the chefs they employed. Ryan had the option to move into one of the executive suites. His parents had lived across the hall from this one, and he had grown up in places just like it. Maybe that's why he preferred his condo on Main Street, or maybe it was his way of avoiding the painful memories of losing his parents. At the least, it was a change of pace, and he liked that it was away from the tourist crowds. Or as far away as you could get from them on the island. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that, Ryan said. He'd had a few days to recover from the initial shock of bumping into a very pregnant Sarah, but felt far from certain about his future, their future. He took another bite of the croissant, his mind still too preoccupied to savor the subtle flavor and texture. I wasn't sure what a joy being a parent was, until the moment I held your father in my arms for the first time. I'm sure all this is a pretty big shock. At least I had nine months to get used to the idea. Grandpa Joe looked at him over his coffee cup. Ryan had worried about breaking the news of his one nightstand and the resulting baby to his grandfather. The old man had taken it all in stride. He seemed more excited than anything. Ryan had figured he'd be in for a lecture. I'm not going to ask you to make an honest woman of the girl, but what are your plans? Don't you think you owe it to her and the child to spend some time getting to know her? Grandpa Joe looked at him expectantly. Ryan nodded. He'd been thinking quite a bit about the future over the past few days. I do. I know I want to know my child and have a hand in raising him. Uh, her. It. He shrugged, feeling slightly embarrassed that he was stumbling his words over what to call this child of theirs. He'd spent some time with Sarah each day, and one of the things he'd learned was that their baby hadn't been cooperative during the ultrasounds so far. She didn't know if it was a little boy or a little girl. Part of him liked the idea of it being a surprise. Another part was anxious to find out as much as he could about his future offspring. Good. I'm proud of you for taking responsibility, Grandpa Joe said. I know I've been giving you a hard time about getting settled and starting a family. Maybe I was a little too harsh giving you that ultimatum. I don't want you left all by yourself. You know, should something happen to me. Ryan knew. It was something that had been on his mind since his parents' death had sunk in. He could understand where his grandfather was coming from. He wasn't looking forward to the day when he would be the last Beckheim either. Living a life without someone to experience those little moments or big celebrations with wasn't something he wanted. And he couldn't imagine going through a life-changing event like the death of his parents without someone to share the pain. Maybe now he wouldn't be the last of his line and he wouldn't be alone. Smiling to himself, he found that he liked that idea. He liked it a lot. Relief flooded through him. Ryan hadn't realized how much the thought of being left alone in this world had bothered him. He returned his attention to his grandfather who looked deep in thought. Nothing is going to happen to you, old man. I expect you to take on grandparent and great-grandparent duties. There better be a big pile of presents under the Christmas tree, and it's your responsibility to teach this child to fish. Ryan looked through the large sliding glass door at the cream-colored leather couch and solid oak coffee table inside. He thought back on all the Christmases as a child when he'd run across the hall to the living room in his grandfather's suite on Christmas morning to open present after present. His grandfather would have staff move the couch each year to make room for a large Christmas tree and the presents stacked under and around it. His grandfather had always spoiled him rotten. And not just at Christmas time and birthdays. The two of them had spent a lot of time together throughout the years. Grandpa Joe had taught Ryan to swim, fish, and catch crabs in the creek of the inlets that surrounded Palmer Island. He wanted the same for his child. 
Don't worry, Grandpa Joe said. I'll make sure of that. I'm going to call my lawyers this week and draw up some paperwork. Sarah and the baby will be well taken care of, no matter what happens between the two of you down the road. Though I have to admit, I'm old-fashioned enough to hope there's a wedding in your future. Ryan coughed, the last bit of pastry getting stuck in the back of his throat. His grandfather's suggestion of marriage caught him off guard. He wasn't ready to think about that yet. One step at a time, Grandpa. We've only been on a handful of dates. Let me at least buy the girl some dinner before I consider popping the question. Grandpa Joe laughed so hard the table shook. All right then, but as far as I'm concerned, she's family now. Which means I expect you to bring her over to meet me soon. Please follow me, the waiter said, before walking off to guide them to their table at Shea Paul's. Ryan gestured for Sarah to walk ahead of him. She waddled off, doing what she could to keep up while avoiding bumping into tables or other diners. Getting around in a crowded restaurant wasn't easy when you looked like you swallowed a watermelon. She felt like it too. Getting ready for this fancy dinner date hadn't been easy. There just weren't any maternity dresses that screamed sophisticated. Not that she'd felt attractive in anything she'd worn these past two months. The third trimester was about getting comfortable, not staying stylish. Sarah guessed that most women didn't go on a first dinner date just weeks before giving birth. She'd done the best she could and Aunt Doris had helped Sarah with her hair. At least her shoes were cute. Or they had been before Sarah put them on. Once she slipped into the black leather sandals, she could no longer see them. The waiter pulled out a chair as far as possible and she awkwardly scooted in before accepting the menu. By the time she looked up, Ryan was seated across from her studying the wine list. Do you have a preference? he asked. The Elk Cove Pinot Gris is pretty decent if you like a crisp white wine. No wine for me. Pregnant, remember? Sarah smiled when she saw him blush. Don't worry about it. Let's order some food. What's good here? she asked. She opened the menu and scanned through the offerings. The menu wasn't quite what she expected. It was printed on creamy white paper. There were a few dishes, and most of them had French sounding names. Sarah didn't recognize any of them. She looked up at Ryan, hoping he would help her out. This isn't your kind of place, is it? he asked. If I'm perfectly honest, no, it isn't. But that's okay. It's good to try new things. What do you recommend? Sarah did her best to sound upbeat and excited. Come on, let's get out of here. Ryan rose and offered her his hand. Sarah looked around, hoping they weren't making a scene. What was he doing? This is fine. Really? I'm sure the food is delicious. Ryan leaned in. It's not my kind of place either. Let's go. I have an idea, he said in a low voice. They were out of there and settled down at a small burger joint in less than 15 minutes. This place has the best burgers and chili cheese fries, Ryan said. Sarah looked around the old diner, already feeling less tense. The booth they picked out had plenty of room and was a lot more comfortable than their table at Shea Paul's. The food at nearby tables smelled delicious. Her mouth watered. A cheeseburger and fries would hit the spot. I wonder if they have shakes, she said before opening the menu. This one was much more colorful and laminated. She didn't even mind the sticky spot on it, much. In short, it was what a menu was supposed to look like. She squealed when she found the milkshake section. I'm Cindy and I'll be your server tonight. What can I get y'all, the waitress asked. Cheeseburger, all the way, with a side of fries, Sarah requested. All the way around here is chili, coleslaw and mustard, Cindy replied. That's just the way I like mine. Sarah grinned happily. I'll take the same, and we'll also have some water and two milkshakes, please, Ryan said. What flavor are you in the mood for? He asked looking at Sarah with the cutest half-smile playing around his lips. He'd been paying attention. Sarah was glad he'd brought it up and ordered a shake for himself as well. 
She really wanted one, but had felt a bit self-conscious about her order. Peanut butter and chocolate, please. A peanut butter and chocolate milkshake for my beautiful date, and a banana one for me. You can bring those shakes out as soon as they are ready. He handed their menus to Cindy before returning his attention to her. So, you think I'm a beautiful date? You might need some glasses, Sarah teased, feeling much more at ease at this place. I have 2020s vision. Had it checked last week. My eyes don't deceive me. They bantered back and forth until their milkshakes arrived. Cindy brought the food a few minutes later, and Sarah was too busy stuffing her face to crack jokes with Ryan. Aside from Shea Paul's, hanging out with Ryan these past few days had been fun. It was easy to spend time with him. They joked around and found they had a lot in common. They were both fiercely competitive, especially on a putt-putt course, and they shared a love of 90s movies. I can't eat another bite. Ryan pushed his plate away. Sarah laughed and snagged a couple of fries off his plate. Lightweight, she teased. No fair. You're eating for two over there. That's a myth. I'm just more of a pig than you are. And I have a better excuse. Sarah patted her belly. The baby was getting restless and started moving around, kicking her in the kidneys in the process. I think the baby liked the cheeseburger as much as we did. It's like someone's tap dancing in there. Can I touch, he asked. Of course. Get over here before things calm down. Sarah scooted over and patted the seat next to her. Usually she couldn't stand it when people tried to touch her pregnant belly, but this was different. Ryan was a part of this baby growing inside her and she enjoyed feeling the firm pressure of his warm hand on her stomach. She looked up at his face to gauge his reaction to the alien movement inside her. He looked, reverent. That was the best way to describe it. They sat there, in the middle of a noisy restaurant, quietly sharing an intimate moment of feeling their growing baby stretch and kick. That can't be comfortable, Ryan said. It isn't, she said with a laugh, hoping this evening would never end. Chapter 3 Ryan looked at his phone and jumped up from his desk. It was much later than he realized. He'd spent the past few hours studying up on home births and newborn care. He hadn't asked Sarah about her birth plan, and she hadn't mentioned how and where she planned to deliver. Truthfully, he hadn't heard the term birth plan until a few hours ago, and it felt like a pretty personal subject. He hoped she wasn't planning on having the baby at Aunt Doris's house. He had watched enough YouTube videos this morning to realize this was something best handled in a hospital with plenty of doctors and nurses around to assist. And if the birth itself wasn't scary enough, keeping the newborn baby alive for the first few weeks brought a whole new set of challenges with it. Who knew that they needed to eat every couple of hours? And then there was burping and diaper changes. When did new parents sleep? From what Ryan had learned so far, Parenting was an around-the-clock job with impossible hours requiring a very unique skill set, one he didn't possess. He hoped Sarah was better prepared than he felt. How did people do this? Surely it couldn't be as hard as what he'd read and watched so far. He was still pondering the challenges of his impending fatherhood when he rang the doorbell at Aunt Doris's house. Sarah's getting ready. She'll be right down. Why don't you come into the kitchen and help me pack this basket, Aunt Doris suggested. She walked off before he could answer. Ryan followed her down the hall and through the old wooden pocket door into a homely kitchen with dark brown cabinets and laminate counters that had seen better days. He liked it. It had a lived-in feel to it. There was a round table with six mismatched chairs around it. The large bay window overlooked the ocean and had a wide bench built into it. The seat covers on the bench matched the checkerboard curtains. Aunt Doris was busy pulling sandwich fixings from the fridge. He strode over to offer her a hand. Go get the sliced bread from the pantry, she ordered, pointing to a small door next to the oven. He opened it and stepped into a surprisingly roomy pantry that was stuffed with canned fruit and vegetables, flour, rice, crackers, cereal, and anything else that could be stored in a cool, dry place. Aunt Doris could open her own little grocery store if she wanted to. 
He found the bread and sat it on the kitchen counter, next to the pile of sandwich meat containers, sliced cheese, and pickles Aunt Doris had set out already. They got to work on the sandwiches. I'm glad you bumped into Sarah, and that the two of you have a chance to spend some time together before the baby is born, Aunt Dora said while piling ham and turkey on several slices of bread that he'd spread mayonnaise on. Ryan got the feeling that she was fishing for information on how he felt about the pregnancy. He was excited about it, but also anxious and confused. He and Sarah had danced around the topic, but hadn't sat down and talked about the future. He shook his head. He didn't want to think about it and he definitely didn't want to talk to Sarah's great-aunt about it. I'm looking forward to showing Sarah my grandfather's boat, he said to change the subject. It's a nice day to be out on the water, she replied, getting his hint and dropping the baby talk. He got busy adding sliced cheese and pickles before handing the sandwiches back to Aunt Doris who wrapped them securely in parchment paper and added them to the picnic basket. That's a lot of food for two people, Ryan said as he watched her pile the basket full of sandwiches, chips, fresh and dried fruit, granola bars and God only knows what else. Being out on the water makes you hungry. And Sarah is eating for two. Don't want her getting too skinny, this close to her time. Aunt Doris seemed undisturbed and walked over to the pantry, presumably looking for more treats to tuck into the basket. You keep a well-stocked pantry, Ryan said, making conversation and hoping Sarah would hurry up so they could get out of here while he could still carry this picnic basket. Doesn't hurt to be prepared, especially this close to the ocean. You never know when a storm blows in. Have you tried going grocery shopping when there's a hurricane on the way? He had, and Aunt Doris had a point. When Florence made her slow approach late last summer, there wasn't a loaf of bread or a bottle of water to be found anywhere on the island. Now I know where to come when they start to run out of milk and eggs at the store, Ryan joked. Aunt Doris nodded, a serious expression on her face. You're welcome here any time. I wouldn't mind having an extra pair of strong hands around when we're riding out a storm. Before he could picture Sarah and Aunt Doris trying to make it through a hurricane this close to the ocean, Sarah walked in, ready to go. You two have fun, Aunt Doris said, before heating up the basket and handing it to him. It was even heavier than he expected. It probably contained enough food for the two of them for a week. I'm starting to think Aunt Doris didn't overpack the basket, Ryan said after tucking into a second sandwich and washing it down with some of the cheer wine soda Sarah had discovered in the bottom of the basket. Her great-aunt had wrapped the glass bottles in kitchen towels to keep them cool. Sarah laughed. She was stretched out on the woolen blanket he'd spread out for them on the small uninhabited island off the South Carolina coast where they had stopped for lunch the bright sun warmed them, despite temperatures in the low 50s. The Beckheim family yacht was anchored a hundred yards out. Ryan had rowed them to the island in a small dinghy that now sat beached in the sand a short way from the spot they'd chosen for their picnic. It was a beautiful spot. The island had a wild beauty to it, with its rocky beaches and scraggy oak trees. They had walked up to a grassy spot that ended up being quite comfortable with the thick blanket. Sarah wasn't entirely sure she could get back up without help, but for now she was content feeling the sun warm her face and watching the sandpipers run along the beach. This place is so peaceful, she said. Not a lot of people know about it, and hardly anyone comes out here this time of the year. My grandfather first brought me out here when I was about 12. I don't think I appreciated how special this place is back then. There aren't too many like it left. Ryan stretched out next to her. It's very different from Aruba, Sarah said, her thoughts traveling back to the fine sand and blue waters of the Caribbean beach they'd made out on during that fateful night eight months ago. Very different, and very similar, Ryan said with a rough voice, thick with emotion. He was looking at her with the same desire she'd seen back in the Caribbean. He leaned in and brushed a few strands of hair that had fallen into her face, behind her ear. Same silky soft hair. I've been dreaming about touching those strands again. She felt his fingers run through them and it sent tingles up her spine. Nice tingles. She watched his eyes travel from her hair to her lips. He was so close. Close enough that she could feel his breath on her face. She closed her eyes, waiting for his lips to brush across hers. 
Instead, she felt a whoosh of cold air and heard a loud screech. Her eyes shot open, and she found herself much closer to a seagull than she ever wanted to be. It pecked at the leftovers of Ryan's sandwich. He jumped up and shooed the large bird away. It took off, a large chunk of bread in its mouth. Sarah saw more birds flying above them. This wasn't good. Let's pack the food away before this turns into a Hitchcock movie, she suggested. Ryan agreed, and they quickly threw the leftover food into the basket and closed it. Wanna go for a stroll across the island before we head back? Ryan asked. That sounds nice. He took her hand to help her up and didn't let go of it while they strolled along the beach. There's something I've been meaning to talk to you about, Sarah said. She paused, not sure how to continue. Okay, shoot. Neither one of us planned on having a baby, she hesitated for a moment before diving in. It was my decision to keep it. I don't want you to worry that I'm going to hold you responsible financially or anything. I'm not. She took a deep breath before she continued. The whole idea of raising this child by myself freaks me out sometimes. I grew up with a single mom and it wasn't easy. My mom struggled a lot, and there were times when we had to do without because the paycheck ran out. I haven't made up my mind or anything, but there are days when I think it might be best to give the baby up. For adoption, you know. He let go of her hand and continued walking without saying a word. Not that I don't want to keep the baby. I do. It's just that I didn't get a chance to finish school. They found some excuse to take my scholarship away when they found out about the pregnancy. I've been looking for work, but who wants to hire a pregnant woman? Aunt Doris has been great. She's been a lifesaver since my mom kicked me out. Sarah knew she was rambling, but couldn't make herself stop. Once she started, the words kept pouring out. All that worry from the past months. She looked over at Ryan. He had stopped, his back turned to her. When he finally moved to face her, his eyes were hard and his jaw clenched. Let's head back to the boat. I don't like the way those clouds are looking, was all he said. By the time they got back to their picnic spot, the weather had taken a turn for the worse. The wind was picking up and dark storm clouds were appearing on the horizon. Sarah folded the blanket and took it down to the dinghy where Ryan was standing. He looked as worried as she felt. Big waves started to crash into the rocks further down. The spot where they had pulled and formed a small harbor, sheltering them from the brunt of it. I'm sorry Sarah, but I don't think it's safe for us to try to make it back to Palmer Island right now. We might be stuck here until the storm blows through. Relief flooded through Sarah. The last thing she wanted to do was get into the tiny rowboat to paddle it out to the yacht. Not that riding for two hours to make it back to the marina on Palmer Island, where they'd set off from this morning, sounded any better. The waves aren't too bad yet. I'm going to row out and make sure everything is secure on the boat, and pick up a few things in case we need to make a shelter for the night. Ryan said. He took the blanket from her and spread it back out close to a boulder that would provide a little protection from the wind. He handed her his jacket before getting in the dinghy and rowing out to the yacht. Sarah watched him struggle to row against the incoming waves. She sent up a little prayer that he would make it there and back in one piece. It hit her how dangerous their situation was. If something happened to him, she would be stranded on this isolated island until someone realized she was missing. Even then, would they be able to find her here? She was without shelter, and only the food and water left in the picnic basket. And she was eight months pregnant. What if she went into labor before help could arrive? Too anxious to sit, she heaved herself up from the blanket and walked down to the shore to keep an eye out for Ryan. To her relief, he had made it to the yacht and was waving at her. He disappeared below deck for a few moments before working on what she assumed was securing the boat. Twenty minutes later, he was on his way back to her. She hugged him as soon as he stepped on dry ground. I found some stuff we can use to try to make this a little more comfortable, Ryan said, after pulling the dinghy high up on the shore and securing it to a small tree trunk. Together, they carried what he brought to the blanket. 
Ryan got to work building a small shelter using a tarp and some rope. They covered the area under it with several thick blankets. By the time it was all said and done, they had a makeshift tent to hunker down for the night. There was plenty of food and water and a small lantern to light up the area after dark. This is kinda cozy, Sarah said as they were sitting in front of the fire he'd built close to their shelter. The wind was still howling, but between their makeshift tent and the small fire they used to heat the canned beans Ryan had brought back, it felt more like they were on a camping trip. She took a deep breath and did her best to relax. Let's see if you still feel that way when we try to sleep with just a few blankets between us and the bare ground, he said before digging a bag of marshmallows from the box of food he'd packed on the boat. S'mores, he asked before handing her a stick. Sarah felt the tension leaving her shoulders. While their situation was far from ideal, she wasn't in any imminent danger. Ryan was here, and he was doing what he could to keep her and their baby safe and comfortable. Sure, why not? She poked a marshmallow on the end of the stick and turned it over the small fire. I'm sorry I freaked you out with the adoption talk earlier. I honestly don't know what I'm going to do. I want to keep the baby, but I also want to give it the best life possible, Sarah said while they were huddled around the fire after darkness fell. And I'm sorry about the way I reacted. I didn't mean to shut you out. It just hit me hard. Ryan sat there, staring into the fire for a moment. My parents died in a plane crash a few years ago. I'm not sure if you knew about that. Sarah shook her head. She'd had no idea. I miss them every day, and when you mentioned adoption, all I could think is that I don't want my child to grow up without knowing his father. I know that's ridiculous. He or she would have an adoptive father. And it's your decision. I just, Ryan's words trailed off into silence. Sarah put an arm around him and laid her head on his shoulder. I know. It doesn't feel right does it? It sounds like the right thing to do in theory, but I don't think I could go through with it. Chapter 4 I'm fine, Aunt Doris. I promise, Sarah said for what felt like the hundredth time. Her great-aunt had been worried sick when Sarah and Ryan didn't make it back to Palmer Island last night. They'd spent the night in their little makeshift shelter. Sometime during the early morning hours the storm had let up, and they had been able to row out to the yacht at first light. Ryan had dropped Sarah off at her aunt's house, before heading home to shower and change. The doorbell rang, and Aunt Doris left the living room where she had tucked Sarah under a pile of blankets on the couch. Sarah was contemplating a nap while she waited for Ryan to come back, when a familiar voice jolted her fully awake. Where is she? Marianne asked. Before Aunt Doris could reply, Sarah's mother was by her side engulfing her into a big hug. Are you okay, baby? I was so worried. I got in the car as soon as Aunt Doris called, her mother said. I'm fine, Mom. We both are. Sarah patted her large belly. Marianne nodded and moved to the chair across from the couch. Good. I'm glad. I hear you finally tracked the father down. Is he ready to take financial responsibility of his child? Sarah couldn't believe how quickly her mother's attitude changed from caring to distant. That's none of your business. You kicked me out, remember? She was stunned at her mother's nerve to march in here and start making demands. Throwing you out was the best thing I could have done for you. It was the wake-up call you needed. Raising a child as a single mother is hard. Believe me, I speak from experience. You need to toughen up or get this Ryan guy to put a ring on your finger before you go into labor, Marianne said. Mom, we barely started seeing each other. Give it a rest. I like him and he seems interested in having an active role in the baby's life. We'll see where this goes. I'm not going to bully him into marriage because I'm pregnant. This isn't the 18th century. Marianne shook her head in disbelief and looked like she was ready to hit Sarah with another lecture. Thankfully, Aunt Doris came in with a large tray of food and a fresh pot of coffee. Sarah could have kissed her. The food smelled delicious and her stomach started growling. She dug into the plate of scrambled eggs, bacon, 
and toast Aunt Doris handed her. When do I get to meet the father? Marianne asked before taking a sip of coffee. Ryan should be back in a couple of hours. I sent him home to clean up and get some rest, Aunt Dora said. You should go take a nap too, Sarah. I can't imagine you got much sleep last night, camping out on that little island. The food and the warmth of the blanket had made Sarah sleepy. She went upstairs to take a nap, leaving her great aunt to entertain her mother. By the time she woke up, Ryan was back. She could hear him talking to Aunt Doris in the living room. Rubbing the sleep from her eyes, she joined them. Feeling better? Ryan asked, looking up as soon as she entered the room. She could feel his eyes traveling from her head to her toes and back up again, taking inventory and making sure she was well. His concern warmed her. He'd been her rock during yesterday's adventure and had done everything he could to make her as comfortable as possible. Much. How about you? Sarah asked. Good as new, he replied. The door to the back porch opened and Sarah's mother walked in, wearing a warm sweater, her hair tousled from the wind. Marianne brushed her fingers through it before walking up to Ryan to introduce herself. So you're the young man who knocked up my daughter. I'm Marianne. Her mother didn't mince words. Sarah groaned, but Ryan took it all in stride. They spent a tense afternoon that involved her mother grilling Ryan and Aunt Doris doing her best to run interference. I'm sure you didn't plan on impending fatherhood, Ryan. Sarah had big plans before this happened. She was accepted in grad school. With a full scholarship. It's a shame that all that hard work and effort has been wasted. There was no stopping her mother when she started on this train of thought. Sarah buried her face in her hands. She was sick and tired of going over the same old argument. I don't agree, Marianne. Sarah has a bright future ahead of her. There's nothing wrong with taking a bit of a break before starting grad school. And you have to admit, she has a very good reason for that break. She'll be back in school in no time and get that degree. I have no doubt, Ryan said. He was speaking with more authority than she'd seen him show. Suddenly, it was easy to picture him in charge of his family's resorts. It was a whole new side of him, and Sarah liked it. You don't think she should put the baby up for adoption? Marianne asked. I don't. Ryan said. I think Sarah will make a wonderful mother and I will do everything in my power to make sure she gets a chance to go back to school as soon as she's ready. I plan on being there for her and our baby, if that's what you're worried about. Sarah could have kissed him. Ryan was taking on her mother and, more importantly, he was on her side. They were in this together. She felt a huge weight lifting off her chest. She didn't know what the future held for Ryan and her. Who knew if their relationship would work out? It was much too soon to tell. But she knew he would be there for her and the baby and that was all that mattered for now. I'm getting hungry. Why don't we order some fish? Would that suit everyone? Aunt Doris asked. Seafood sounds perfect, Sarah said, picking up her phone to place the order. She was grateful for the distraction and hoped her mother would but out of her relationship with Ryan. Mom, if you're back in my life, we need to set some ground rules. I don't appreciate you grilling Ryan like that. You can't just waltz in here and throw around accusations when you don't know anything about my life or my relationships, Sarah said the moment Ryan walked out the door. I have every right. I carried you and I raised you. All by myself. It's my duty as your mother to keep you from making the same mistakes I did. Marianne glared at Sarah, as unwilling to give an inch as her daughter was. The words started to sink in, and Sarah paused. What do you mean the same mistakes I made, she said. I guess it's time you learned the whole story about your dad, Marianne said. Your father and I weren't married. You already know that. What you don't know is that we were engaged to be married when I became pregnant. We'd planned to have the wedding a few months after you were born, but he left us when you were about two months old. He couldn't handle the whole parenting thing. Or at least that's what he said. 
He came from a wealthy family, much like Ryan's, and his father made sure he wasn't on the birth certificate when you were born. When he left, his father offered me $200,000 to cut all ties and never mention who your father was. At the time, that seemed like a lot of money, and I took the deal. He had his lawyers draw up all sorts of paperwork, of course. Sarah was stunned. In all these years, her mother had never shared any of this with her. Why didn't you tell me, she asked. Marianne shrugged. What good would it have done? He knows about you and how to find me. In all these years, he hasn't shown any interest in you, and per the contract I signed, neither one of us is supposed to seek him out. What happened to the money? Sarah asked, thinking back on all the nights when they'd had nothing more than plain macaroni and cheese for dinner. You don't remember this, but I stayed home with you for the first two years. Between not working and spending the money faster than I should have on toys and trips, it didn't last very long. I'm sorry about that. It's why I worked so hard to make sure we had everything we needed. Marianne's shoulders slumped and she looked at her feet. It almost made Sarah feel sorry for her mother. Sarah nodded. She didn't blame Marianne for her choices. She wasn't sure she would have acted all that differently given the same circumstances. It wasn't like she was working a job right now. The difference was that she had Aunt Doris to help out. Her mother had been on her own back then. I don't regret having you. Don't ever think that but it wasn't easy raising you by myself. I don't want you to struggle like I did. Marianne's eyes were full of compassion. I won't. I have Aunt Doris and it looks like Ryan is going to be in the picture. I would love for you to be part of the baby's life as well, but I understand if you don't want to. Of course I'll be here for the baby. And for you. I was so stern because I wanted something better for you. Marianne's shoulders dropped and she looked down at her hands. I didn't want you to have to fight so hard to make things work. At least make sure he's on the birth certificate so you can get child support. I'll think about it. Her mom didn't look convinced. I promise I'll give it some serious consideration. I would like to make things work out with Ryan if I can, at least for the baby's sake. I'm not sure insisting on child support is the best way to do that. He's a good guy mom, and I'm pretty sure he'll be there no matter what. Her mother nodded. It's your call. Just don't count on it. I won't. I think we'll be fine with or without him. I won't be alone in this. I have the two of you on my side. She smiled at her mother and Aunt Doris, who had walked in at the tail end of the conversation. The older woman patted her on the shoulder. That you have, honey and you're going to be a great mother. Chapter 5 It doesn't really feel like Christmas without snow, Sarah said as they strolled arm in arm across the Palmer Island Christmas market. The town and the vendors had done everything possible to get visitors into the holiday spirit, but the weather in the high 60s was making it a challenge. Ryan laughed. You'll get used to it. I spent all my Christmases, growing up here or in the Caribbean. This almost feels cool. And there's just something about palmetto trees, with lights on them to spread Christmas cheer. How about you? What was Christmas like when you were little, he asked. My mom moved us up to Boone, in the North Carolina mountains, when I was three. She got a job at the college up there. It's a beautiful area, and it gets quite a bit of snow. We didn't have a white Christmas every year or anything but plenty throughout the winter to get us in the mood. Sarah said. Let's see what we can do to get you into a more festive state of mind. How about some hot chocolate and waffles? Ryan was dragging her to the waffle stall before she had a chance to respond. Her stomach started growling at the sweet scent of freshly baked Belgian waffles. A few minutes later, he had her settled on a surprisingly comfortable park bench with a cup of hot chocolate topped with whipped cream and a warm waffle dusted with plenty of powdered sugar. They watched a group of young children play with a pile of fake snow. What do you think the snow is made out of? Sarah asked. I have no idea. But the kids don't seem to mind that it isn't the real thing, he said. 
Ryan was right. The kids were busy making snow angels and throwing the white powdery flakes on each other. A little further down, a snowball fight was in full swing. A small play area had been fenced off and the kids were throwing soft white balls, which actually looked like snowballs from a distance, at each other. They could hear the yelps and squeals when someone was hit. It made her smile. This is fun. I think I might just get into the Christmas spirit despite the heat. Even the decorated palmetto trees are growing on me, Sarah said. Wait until you see them after dark when they are all lit up. It's magical. Sarah could hear the excitement in Ryan's voice and could suddenly picture him as a young boy, anxious to find out what Santa was bringing him this year. I can't wait, she said before taking a bite of her waffle. You've got some powdered sugar there, Ryan said as he leaned in and gently brushed it off her chin. The simple touch made Sarah's heart race. He was close enough for her to see the golden flecks in his green-brown eyes. Some days they looked more green, others more brown. Today was a green day. Or maybe it was the light that made the color change. She found herself paying attention to every little detail when it came to Ryan. She noticed his eyes, how his hair looked when it was tousled by the breeze off the ocean, like it was today, and how the tone of his voice changed when he spoke to her in private moments like the one they were sharing right now. Watch out. Sarah looked up just in time to see one of those fake snowballs heading their way. Ryan reached up, catching the white fluff ball before it could land on her waffle, or worse, in her hot chocolate. Thanks, Sarah said, and laughed when he tossed the snowball back to the kids, hitting one of them square in the chest. He was such a show-off. Tell me about growing up in Boone. Did you go to school there? Ryan took a big bite of his own waffle while waiting for her reply. I did. I graduated from Appalachian University earlier this year. I was planning on moving to Charleston over the summer to start grad school. She looked around for something to distract him before he could ask more questions. She wasn't fast enough. How did you end up on Palmer Island instead, he asked. Sarah wasn't sure she wanted to pour her heart out, but decided it was time to share the consequences of her unplanned pregnancy. I had a scholarship to College of Charleston, but when I approached them about my pregnancy and the need to take a few weeks off to give birth, they decided to award it to someone else. I couldn't afford to enroll without it and thought it would be easier to hold off and try again next year. That doesn't seem fair, Ryan said. I'm pretty sure you could appeal that. It still doesn't explain why you moved down here though. He looked at her expectantly. My mom kicked me out. She thought I was ruining my life by deciding to have a baby and raising a child on my own. Sarah kept her head down, studying the pattern of the cobbled pavement in front of her. Hey, he said, gently lifting her face up so she would look at him. That's an awful thing for her to do, and I'm sorry about everything you went through by yourself. Because of me. I had no idea how much this pregnancy has cost you. I'm here now, and I'm not going anywhere. I would like to raise this baby, our baby with you. Sarah swallowed hard and nodded. He hugged her, and she buried her face in his shoulder, holding back tears. She didn't let herself believe that Ryan would actually stick around, but it was nice to feel supported and cared for. He kissed the top of her head and Sarah felt tears pooling in the corners of her eyes. She couldn't wait to be done with those stupid pregnancy hormones. I got powdered sugar all over your shirt, Sarah said with a groan, and got to work brushing the white dust off his shoulder. Don't worry about it. I'll pretend it's snow. Ryan smiled and brushed her hair out of her face. Her mouth went dry and she couldn't keep her eyes off him. It was all she could do to keep from reaching up and running her fingers along his strong jaw. She could see just a hint of stubble on his cheeks and neck and imagined what it would feel like under her fingertips. Sarah realized that she was starting to fall for this man she'd barely known a few weeks ago. She was busy admiring his handsome face when Ryan suddenly jumped up dropping his empty cup and plate in the process. He was running towards the old-fashioned carousel in the middle of the Christmas market. She was confused. Then she saw it. A young toddler, who couldn't be more than two years old, 
had somehow managed to climb under the barricade and was heading straight for the spinning carousel. Her heart stopped. If Ryan didn't reach him in time, the little one could get hurt. She watched him leap the guard fence with one hand on the rail. A second later, he scooped the little boy up just before he reached the spinning attraction. Sarah let out the breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding. The little boy was safe. Brandon. A young woman made her way to the carousel, with a four-year-old girl in tow, and carrying a baby in a sling. Sarah watched Ryan walk over to the mother, returning the small runaway to her. You're a hero, Sarah said with a big smile on her face, when Ryan returned to her. That was nothing, he said while bending down to pick up his cup and plate, tossing them into the trash connects to their bench. That little boy could have been seriously hurt if you hadn't acted as quickly as you did. That makes you a hero in my book. Ryan's lips twitched, and he gave Sarah that cute half-smile that made butterflies dance in her stomach. Let's go check out the rest of the market, Ryan said, holding both his hands out to help her off the bench. She grabbed them, and as she rose, she found herself just inches from his face. Her protruding belly touched his rock-hard stomach. Their hands were still intertwined, hanging at their sides. He touched his forehead to hers for a moment. I'm glad I bumped into you, Ryan whispered. So am I, she said. The rest of the world disappeared as he brought their hands to his face and kissed the back of hers. When he lowered his face and brushed his lips across her own, Sarah felt a shiver run through her entire body. Powdered sugar, he mumbled and she could feel the smile on his face, before he ran his hand through her hair and deepened the kiss. Sarah felt a little breathless when they finally broke apart. He pulled her close to his side as they walked off to watch the Christmas tree lighting ceremony, which was about to start. Sarah was lost in thoughts of the kiss and the encounter with the little boy before that. Ryan was someone who thrived on purpose and responsibility, she realized. He would make a great father. Chapter 6 You really didn't have to do this, Sarah said for the tenth time. She was lying on a small examination table with her stomach exposed, waiting for the OBGYN to come in. We've talked about this. I want you to have the best care possible, and this is part of it. Dr. Martin wants to have a look, and if I'm honest, I'm looking forward to seeing my child. Ryan squeezed her hand. The door opened and a middle-aged woman wearing light blue scrubs and tennis shoes walked in. I'm Dr. Martin. It's nice to meet you. Let's have a look at this baby. Wow, that's cold. The gel on her belly almost made Sarah leap off the table. Sorry about that. I should have warmed this a bit. We usually have an ultrasound technician do this, but she's out sick today. Her bedside manners are much better than mine. Dr. Martin used the ultrasound wand to spread out the gel. Thankfully, it warmed quickly and Sarah was able to relax as the first glimpses of her baby started to appear on the monitor. Looks like we made the little one jumpy too, Dr. Martin said. Sarah looked over at the monitor and could see little arms and legs moving around. They corresponded to the wiggles and kicks she could feel in her belly. This is amazing. Ryan's face was glued to the screen, his hand still squeezing hers. It made her heart flutter to see him this excited about their child. She couldn't help but smile. So far, she'd been alone at these prenup appointments. Having someone to share them with was nice. She hadn't realized how lonely she'd been on this journey to motherhood so far. Having Ryan by her side, supporting her, and sharing in the joys and the worries gave her strength. She could do this. For the first time in a long time, Sarah was looking forward to giving birth and holding her baby in her arms. Would you like to know the sex of the baby? Dr. Martin asked. Yes. Sarah and Ryan said in unison. Dr. Martin moved the wand-like contraption around a bit and then pointed to a spot on the screen. Looks like you're having a little boy. A son? We're having a son? Ryan's voice was cracking, thick with emotion. You are, congratulations. Now let's do a quick check on the vital organs, and I'll take some measurements to see if we can get a better idea of your due date and how big the baby is right now. 
Dr. Martin looked up at Sarah. Relax, I'll be done in a few minutes and then we'll get some better images and printouts for you guys to put on your fridge. Sarah leaned back on the examination table and tried to relax. She looked up at Ryan. He had the goofiest grin on his face and couldn't take his eyes off the screen. Everything's looking good. He's an active little guy, isn't he? Dr. Martin finished up the ultrasound and handed them three different pictures before cleaning the gel from Sarah's stomach. He's fully grown and could come any time now. If I had to guess, I'd say you're looking at delivery sometime between Christmas and New Year's. I want to have you come back in at least once a week until we start to see signs of early labor. If you start to have contractions or your water breaks, I want you to call me. Sarah nodded. She liked Dr. Martin. She was much nicer than the staff at the free clinic up in Myrtle Beach that had been handling her prenatal care so far. Thank you for setting this up, she said as they walked out to the car. I like her, but are you sure you want to pay out of pocket for all this? I wouldn't have insisted and dragged you over here if I was worried about the bills. This is my baby you're carrying, our son. The least I can do is make sure the two of you get the best care possible. Ryan opened the passenger side door and helped her get in. Are you up for a little shopping? I was hoping we could go look at strollers and cribs. I did a little research and made a list. You're going to spoil him rotten, Sarah said and laughed. Oh no, I just realized something, we're going to have to come up with a name for him. It's almost Christmas and I've been putting this off for too long. Ryan handed her a slip of paper. Add baby name book to the list, he said. Sarah looked down. The list was a mile long and included everything from diapers and swaddling blankets to a changing table and playpen. She hoped he wasn't planning on shopping for all of this in one afternoon. She was getting tired just looking at the list. Where are we going to put all this stuff? Aunt Doris threw her hands up when Ryan came back with yet another armful of baby items. I suggested we drop off some of this at my place, but Sarah wanted it all here. Ryan was a bit disappointed that she had shut down his idea. He thought it was a clever way to hint at the fact that he wouldn't mind having her and the baby move in with him. It hadn't worked, and she had looked completely worn out. He had driven them here and had started unloading his SUV after getting her settled on the couch. Please tell me this is the last of it? No child could possibly need this many things. Aunt Doris closed the door behind him. It is. It's really not all that much. I'll put the crib and changing table together and we can get everything put away. Ryan was hoping his offer would appease the older woman. She had taken Sarah in when her own mother had kicked her out, and Ryan would always be grateful to Aunt Doris for her kindness. There's no need to do that today. The baby isn't due for another couple of weeks, and you've both had a long day. Why don't you join Sarah in the living room, and I'll bring you some coffee. Ryan hugged Aunt Doris before she could walk off. Thank you, he said. For everything you're doing for Sarah. You're quite the charmer, aren't you? Aunt Doris smiled at him. I might just be able to find some fresh-baked cookies to go with that coffee. Now get in there, and let me put on the pot. Ryan did as he was told and joined Sarah, who was busy sorting through the outfits they had picked out for the baby. We should have gotten some of that baby detergent, she said. I'm going to need to wash all this before the baby gets here. It can wait. You've had a long day. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and relax for a bit? Aunt Doris is bringing coffee and cookies. I'm almost done. Look at this adorable onesie. She held it up for him to see. Ryan enjoyed seeing her this excited. Something had shifted in her mood these past few days. She was talking more and more about the baby and about getting ready for the new arrival. He liked the change, and he liked that Sarah included him in her decisions. Together, they sorted through the rest of the baby clothes, removing tags and packaging and getting everything ready to be washed and dried. They were done by the time Aunt Doris arrived with the coffee and a large plate of fresh chocolate chip cookies. The rest of the afternoon went by in a blur. 
It started raining, and the heavy drops hitting the metal roof of the house created a soothing background sound. Aunt Doris's living room was cozy and comfortable. Very different from the decor of his grandfather's suite at the resort. Ryan liked it and felt at home in this house. This was the kind of place he wanted to live in and raise his children in. More coffee? Aunt Doris asked. Ryan declined and looked down at Sarah. She had drifted off to sleep during a lull in their conversation. He gently brushed her cheek, trying hard not to wake her, but unable to keep his hands off her. She looked so peaceful. Her lips turned into a small smile, and it tugged at his heart. I should go, he whispered before gently extricating himself from the couch and getting Sarah settled more comfortably. She obviously needed a nap. Aunt Doris nodded and picked up the empty cups and cookie plate. Do you mind joining me in the kitchen for a moment, she asked when they were in the hall. He followed Aunt Doris and sat across from her at the large kitchen table. What's on your mind, he asked. Things are getting pretty serious between you and Sarah. I think it's time we had a talk. You see, her father isn't in the picture and her mother isn't here right now, so it falls to me to ask this. She paused for a moment and took a deep breath, as if to gather her strength and courage. What are your intentions towards my great-niece? Chapter 7 I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a break. How about we take a stroll downstairs and grab some lunch at Oishi's? Grandpa Joe suggested. Works for me. Ryan got up from his chair and stretched. He had spent the past few hours with his grandfather going over numbers, projections, and future building plans. The two of them got together for these meetings regularly, and each time Ryan realized how much he still had to learn before he could take over as owner and CEO of Beckheim Resorts. He grabbed his jacket off the back of the chair and straightened his tie. Christmas music was playing as they rode the elevator down to the main lobby. What do you think of the plans for the new property in Destin? Grandpa Joe asked. The land looks like a great deal, but won't a building project of that magnitude create cash flow issues? We could build the hotel complex and half the condos, and consider the rest for phase two a year later, Ryan suggested. That's not a bad idea. I'll have the finance department crunch the numbers. Grandpa Joe nodded. You've come a long way these past few months and you have a keen eye for business. I'll rest easy knowing I'm leaving the business in capable hands. I don't know about that. I didn't realize how much I don't know yet. Ryan wasn't sure how his grandfather would react to the admission. He felt a strong hand on his shoulder. That's how I know you're ready, Ryan. A wise leader realizes that he doesn't know everything and surrounds himself with advisors he trusts. They stepped out of the elevator and into the large lobby of the ancient Mariner Resort. It was bright and cheery, even during the winter months and on rainy days like today. A large Christmas tree was set up in the center. It was easily 10 feet tall and decorated with beach-themed ornaments and colored lights. Someone had put wrapped boxes topped with bows around the base of the tree and a toy train on tracks circled everything. Sarah would love this display, Ryan said. When do I finally get to meet the woman who's carrying your child? Grandpa Joe smiled and nodded at the guests they passed on their way to the restaurant. Soon. All this can be a bit much. Ryan looked out to the lobby of the expansive resort before turning back. Maybe we can meet for lunch somewhere, he suggested, before opening the door to the restaurant and gesturing for Grandpa Joe to walk ahead of him. Tell me about Sarah. How are things going with the pregnancy? Grandpa Joe prompted after they were seated and the waiter had brought them two ice waters. Everything is going well. I took her in for a well check with Dr. Martin. She seems very competent. Thanks for the recommendation. Oh and we found out that we're having a little boy. Ryan couldn't suppress the proud smile that spread across his face. That's wonderful. Another Beckheim to carry on the family legacy. How about we wait until after he's born before we start grooming him to take over the business? Ryan was only half teasing. While he was happy to step in to replace his grandfather, he would have liked the option to pursue a different career when he was growing up. 
he was determined that his son would be able to make his own choices when the time came. Good. That means you plan on being a father to the boy. I take it you're spending a lot of time with Sarah? Grandpa Joel looked at him expectantly across the table where they had been seated. Ryan picked up the sushi menu and studied it for a moment. I am. I like her. I like her a lot. She's funny and smart. She has a good heart and I think she will make a great mother. I like being around her. It's hard to describe. I feel lighter when I'm with Sarah. He knew he sounded corny and kept his eyes glued to the menu, pretending to make his sushi choice. Sounds to me that you more than just like her. The tone of his grandfather's voice made him look up from the menu. I'm glad to hear it, Grandpa Joe continued before picking up his own menu. The dragon roll looks good. I should really try some of this deep-fried sushi as well. I hear it makes or breaks a restaurant these days. Ryan was glad for the change in subject. You can't go wrong with spicy tuna. I might try an order of tempura vegetables. They placed their order, and Ryan sat back to relax until the food arrived. The new restaurant looked great. Oishi had opened two weeks earlier after months of renovations. The dark red walls contrasted well with the black tables and chairs. With his grandfather's diligence and an eye for talent in the hospitality industry, he was sure the food would be fresh and delicious. The place turned out well, Ryan said. It's going to be packed once word gets around. Grandpa Joe smiled, looking pleased. I think so too. Your grandmother would have loved it. She was a remarkable woman. Smart and funny like your Sarah. His grandfather looked wistful. I know the feeling you're describing. It's being in love. The waiter arrived with their order. The chef had arranged their sushi rolls on a large piece of slate. Ryan unwrapped his chopsticks and set them on his plate. Was he in love? I don't know about that. It's a little early to talk about love. I like her, and I like the idea of raising our child together. Grandpa Joe nodded and popped a piece of sushi in his mouth. Ryan followed suit. The spicy tuna was fresh and delicious. Not that he'd expected anything less. His grandfather only hired the best of the best. I'm happy for you, Grandpa Joe said in between bites. I have a feeling things will work out between you and Sarah. I hope so too, said Ryan and meant it. He wanted Sarah and the baby in his life, permanently. Grandpa Joe picked up another piece of dragon roll. We'll head up to my office after lunch. I had the legal team draw up some paperwork I'd like you to take with you and look over. You're ready to take over the company, and it's time we make it official. It was all Ryan could do to swallow the piece of temper fried sweet potato. Are you sure? he asked. Of course I'm sure. This was never about a child or a wife. While well, I would like for you to have loved ones around you after I'm gone, it is about taking responsibility. You've shown me these past few weeks that you've grown into the man your father and I had hoped you'd become. I'm proud of you, and I know you will make a wonderful husband and father. And you'll take care of the company. Grandpa Joe pulled a small box out of his pocket and slid it across the table. I want you to have this. For when the time comes. It was your grandmother's, and I know she would want you to give it to Sarah. Ryan opened the box and looked at the large princess cut diamond that used to grace his grandmother's hand. Sarah was busy folding a stack of freshly washed baby clothes when the doorbell rang. She got up and set the basket aside, grateful for the interruption. Her back was aching, and walking the few steps to the front door would do her good. She opened the door, wondering who would stop by this time of day. Hi there. Ryan stood in front of her holding an old teddy bear. I brought this. He held the stuffed animal out towards her. Was it yours? she asked. It was. I thought the baby might like it. My mother saved him. Do you mind? Of course not. That's adorable. She flashed him a big smile and held her hand out for the bear. I love it. 
When she looked up, the look in Ryan's face took her breath away. She saw pride shining through, and something else she couldn't quite figure out. She liked that look and wondered not only what she had done to cause it, but also how she could do it again. Come in, Sarah said and led the way to the living room. You washed everything. Ryan walked over to the stack of folded baby clothes, pulling one of the outfits out to look at it. Sit down and help me finish folding these, she suggested. Want me to build the dresser so we can put everything away? Ryan asked when they were done. That would be great. Sarah walked with him to her room and together they figured out how they could rearrange the furniture to add the small dresser and crib to the room. You're pretty handy to have around, Sarah joked while she watched him assemble the baby furniture. She wiped out the drawers and put away the clothes while Ryan assembled the crib. By the end of the afternoon, the room looked ready for the baby. Sarah wasn't entirely sure if she felt relieved that everything was ready, or anxious, because it made the idea of motherhood seem even more real. I'm starving. How about pizza? Sarah suggested to distract herself. She was tired and ready to stretch out on the couch. Pizza sounds great. Ryan rose and rubbed his back. He didn't look as tired as she felt, but she figured he wouldn't mind putting his feet up for a bit either. I'll call it in and we can watch a movie. Aunt Doris has a bunch of old DVDs. Any preference? In the movie or the pizza? You pick. Anything but anchovies, he said. Sarah knew there was a reason she liked Ryan. He was easy to please and easy to love. She was falling for him, and while it surprised her, it didn't scare her. It felt right. She tried not to get her hopes up, but more and more often she found herself daydreaming about raising this baby together with him. With that thought in mind, she chose three men and a baby from the movie collection and ordered the pizza. By the time Ryan had the boxes and tools put away, the pizza arrived. One of the advantages of living this close to Main Street was that you could have a pizza delivered in record time. It came in handy while she was pregnant and craving it constantly. Ryan opened the box. Mushroom, olives, and pepperoni. My favorite. How did you know? Sarah laughed. I had no idea. I'd been craving that combination for the past eight months. Now I know why. They curled up on the couch with the box and started the movie. Taking care of a baby doesn't look all that easy, does it? Sarah said while she grabbed another slice. On the screen, three grown men were struggling to change a diaper. Do you have much experience? Ryan asked. None, Sarah admitted. She could feel the heat rising in her cheeks. She'd grown up without siblings or younger cousins. Sure, she'd held a baby here and there, but so far, she hadn't changed a diaper or tried to feed a baby. She'd told Aunt Doris about it a few nights ago. The older woman had waved away her fears and told her it wasn't all that complicated. Me neither. Ryan's eyebrows were drawn together, and he was rubbing the side of his face. I wonder if there's some sort of class we should take. Sarah nodded. A class and a bit of practice sounded like a good idea. I'll ask around and see what I can find, she said. She heard the front door open. A minute later, Aunt Doris came in, several large bags in her hands. Ryan jumped up from the couch to help her. That's not how you change a diaper, Aunt Doris sounded indignant. She was looking at the screen where Sarah had paused the movie. You're not watching that to learn how to take care of a baby, are you? Good thing I got these. She pulled a baby doll, clothes, and small diapers from her bag. Sarah was confused. They were having a boy and while she was open to the idea of him playing with dolls if that's what he wanted to do, it would be years before he was ready for a baby doll. Good idea, Ryan said. He pulled a diaper out of the pack and put the baby on the couch. Sarah's pregnancy brain finally caught on. Thank you, Aunt Doris. This is perfect. She hugged her great aunt before joining Ryan on the couch. They struggled with the onesie but eventually figured out how to undress the doll. Sarah held up the diaper and tried to figure out how it would work. 
Aunt Doris scared and shooed both of them away. Let me show you how it's done, she said, before demonstrating how to put on a diaper securely before redressing the doll in record time. Sarah and Ryan each practiced a few times before Aunt Doris seemed confident that they knew what they were doing. Of course it's much easier on a doll than with a real baby. They squirm around, and if your little one is anything like you, he'll fight you any time you try to put clothes on him. I didn't realize you knew me well as a baby, Sarah said. Of course I did. I came up when you were born and helped Marianne get settled in. I went back and forth until you moved to Boone. Sarah had seen pictures of herself and Aunt Doris when she was a baby, but had always assumed those were taken on rare visits. Try again. You both should get as much practice as you can before the baby is born. You'll need it. Imagine doing this with a cat. That's about what it's like to change a three-month-old. Aunt Doris left and Sarah looked up at Ryan. He looked as worried as she felt. Changing a cat does not sound like fun. We are definitely in trouble, said Ryan. Sarah nodded. They were in trouble. She was glad Ryan was here, practicing and worrying with her. It was nice to have a partner in this. She didn't feel alone anymore. She watched him cradle the freshly diapered and dressed baby doll, and realized she loved him. She'd loved him for quite some time, and couldn't wait to see him hold their son. Chapter 8 Ryan read the last page of the contract his grandfather's lawyers had drawn up for the takeover. He smiled when he saw that the air clause was left in, followed by directions on what parts of the operation he would start to take over. Grandpa Joe would continue to take an active role for a couple of years, giving over more and more responsibilities to Ryan before retiring completely. His grandfather must have put a lot of thought into the process, and it sounded like a solid plan. Ryan signed the contract and returned it to his desk moments before Sarah arrived. Let me give you the full tour. You only saw the living room and kitchen the day I bumped into you. Ryan smiled, thinking back on the day that had turned his life around. He grabbed her hand and led her through the two bedrooms and the adjoining bath. It's a little small, for all three of us. I've been looking into something bigger. Not that I expect you to move in with me right away, but I want you to know that it's an option. Really no pressure. He sounded like an idiot. This wasn't the way to woo the woman carrying his child. Let me start over. I've been thinking about a bigger place for a while. I know it's early, but I hope things work out between the two of us. If they do, I would love for you and the baby to move in with me. He looked up to gauge her reaction. Okay. Sarah hesitated. I like the idea, too. A lot, actually. But I'm not ready to make that kind of commitment. Of course. We'll take it slow and see how things go after the baby is here. We should really come up with a name. It feels weird to refer to him as baby now that I've seen him, Ryan said. What was your father's name? Sarah asked. Charles. Charles Beckheim, Ryan replied. Charles. Charlie. I like it. How would you feel about naming him after your father? Sarah asked. Ryan hadn't considered the idea. The more he thought about it, the more he liked it. It would be a nice way to honor his father and keep the memory of him alive. He nodded. Charlie Beckheim. It's a good name. Are you ready to give the baby your last name? Sarah asked. You would have to be on the birth certificate for that. Ryan was surprised. Why wouldn't I? If things don't work out. Between us, I mean, Dash Sarah sat on his couch wringing her hands. She didn't look up at him. He sat down next to her and gently raised her face toward his, until they were eye to eye. I hope things work out between us, and I think they will. But there's something I need you to know. No matter what happens, I'm going to be there for you and Charlie, and I will be on the birth certificate. He's my son and my responsibility. He leaned in and gently brushed his lips across hers. He would never get enough of the feeling of her soft mouth on his. Okay, he heard her murmur, feeling the soft sound as much as hearing it. 
She put her arms around his neck and he pulled her closer, losing himself in their kiss. They didn't break apart until his phone rang. That was my realtor, Ryan said a few moments later. He's found a few houses that might work and set up some viewings this afternoon. Are you up for a bit of house hunting? You're serious about getting a bigger place? Sarah asked. I am. This condo is getting a little small. I'm not saying I'm ready to buy, and I don't expect you and the baby to move in with me right away, but it couldn't hurt to look, right? Ryan held his breath, waiting for her reaction. He was surprised at how important it was to have her choose this house with him. He wanted it to be their house, the place where the two of them would raise their family, he realized. If he didn't think she'd run for the hills, he proposed to her right here and now. His grandmother's engagement ring was still in his pocket. Maybe buying a house big enough for the three of them to comfortably live in would help Sarah see that he was serious and wanted her and the baby in his life permanently. Okay, Sarah said. We can go look at houses. I'm not promising that I'll move in though. It's a deal. Ryan looked down at his phone. Thomas texted me the address for the first property. Ready? You look exhausted. Why don't you stretch out on the couch, Ryan said after they got back. Looking at four different houses all across the island had been a bit much. Each of them had been huge. Sarah knew his family had money, but the properties they'd looked at today were multi-million dollar oceanfront homes. It had been an eye-opening experience. Ryan brought her a glass of water and helped her take off her shoes. Hungry, he asked. Starving. How about I run down to Mary's and pick us up some lunch? What sounds good? I love Mary's grilled chicken salad. Sarah paused for a moment. And some chili cheese fries, for the baby, she added with a grin. Being pregnant lets you get away with that kind of thing. You've got it. Relax and I'll be back in a few. She watched Ryan walk out the door and tried to rest. Baby Charlie started kicking up a storm. He had been doing that quite a bit any time she sat or laid down and tried to rest. Today it felt like he was using her bladder as a trampoline. Sarah struggled up from the couch and headed to the bathroom. On her way back, she strolled through the condo, hoping the walking would calm Charlie down. A stack of papers on Ryan's desk caught her attention. She recognized the logo and found herself scanning through the writing. It was a contract of some sort about the family-owned corporation. From the sound of it, Ryan was taking on more responsibilities. Good for him. It sounded like he was in for a big promotion. Sarah was about to walk back to the couch when a word caught her attention air. She bent down for a closer look. This couldn't be right. If she understood the legal jargon right, Ryan's big promotion depended on him having an heir. Was that the reason he had been so attentive and involved? Sarah thought back to their conversation earlier today. Ryan had all but insisted on being on her baby's birth certificate. It was all starting to make sense. This wasn't about her or Charlie. This was about business for him. Tears started to pool in her eyes. Stupid pregnancy hormones. She couldn't fall apart, not here, not now. She needed to get out of here. I don't want to talk to him. Sarah closed the door to her room, leaving Aunt Doris to deal with Ryan. She'd ignored his text messages and refused to take his phone calls. Sarah couldn't believe how stupid she'd been. Her mother was right. You couldn't count on men to stick around. He needed her baby to gain control of the family business. That's why he'd spent time with her and bought the crib and dresser she was staring at. Part of her wanted to throw it all out. I'll deal with him, she heard Aunt Doris say through the door. But I expect you to tell me what's going on. Meet me in the kitchen. I'll make us some tea. Sarah sighed. She had done her best to avoid the topic, only telling her great-aunt that it was over with Ryan and that she didn't wish to speak to him. Ever. Sarah stepped over to the bedroom window that overlooked the street. Ryan's car was parked in the driveway. 
She waited until she saw him pull out before she walked into the kitchen. Aunt Doris had two cups of herbal tea ready and motioned for her to sit down at the table. Her face looked serious. That boy is devastated and you don't look happy either. Tell me what happened. Aunt Doris had that determined look on her face and Sarah knew she wasn't getting out of this conversation until her great-aunt had some answers. She took a sip of her tea and then a deep breath. Ryan isn't devastated, at least not the way you think. When I was over at his place the other day, I came across some papers. The only reason he's spending so much time with me and pretends to want to be involved in the baby's life is because he needs an heir before his grandfather gives him control over the company. He can't be CEO without a child. It's called a legacy clause, I think. Aunt Dora sat there quietly, looking first at Sarah, then at her own teacup. Where was this paperwork? In a drawer or folder, she finally asked. No, of course it wasn't. I wouldn't go snooping through Ryan's stuff. It was out on his desk. He must have forgotten he had it out when I came over. Part of Sarah wished she'd never seen it. She missed Ryan and had cherished the idea of raising their child together as a family. She could feel the tears pooling in her eyes. She had cried more in the past 24 hours than she could remember. He left the papers out in the open? Aunt Doris asked to confirm. Sarah nodded. Don't you think he would have put them away or kept them at the office if this was something he was trying to keep from you? Sarah shrugged her shoulders. Maybe he forgot. I'm glad I found it. I'd rather know now than after the baby is born. I'm not sure I want him to have any part in Charlie's life. She'd have to rethink the baby's name. They had both started referring to their son by the name they had picked together, but now she no longer liked the idea of naming her child after Ryan's father. Something doesn't seem right. I think you should talk to Ryan and see if the two of you can work through this. He is Charlie's father and nothing is going to change that. Don't you think you owe him at least a chance to make it right? Aunt Doris grabbed Sarah's hand and squeezed it encouragingly. No. I was stupid enough to listen to his lies the first time. I'm not going to do it again. Ryan may be the baby's biological father, but I'm going to make sure he won't be involved in any way. I'm not going to let him use my baby. That's all he needed from us. We're better off without him. Sarah knew she was rambling and made herself stop. She finished her tea and stood up to take the cup over to the sink. I don't want to talk about it anymore. When she turned back around, she saw Aunt Doris nod thoughtfully. I have a few errands to run. I'll be back in a couple of hours, her great-aunt said. Sarah was out on the back deck when Aunt Doris returned. She heard a deep male voice and for a moment she was scared that Ryan was in the house. Relief flooded through her when the voices came closer and she realized it wasn't his. Aunt Doris stepped out on the deck with an older gentleman. There you are, she said with a smile on her face. There's someone I would like you to meet. This is Joseph Beckheim, Ryan's grandfather. Sarah could feel all the blood leaving her face. Call me Grandpa Joe. I've been looking forward to meeting you, Sarah. Ryan has told me a lot about you. He held his hand out toward her. Only now did Sarah notice that she was standing. She shook the older man's hand, in a daze. Why had Aunt Doris brought him over here? It is nice to meet you, Sarah said automatically. She was relieved when Aunt Doris took charge of the conversation and motioned for everyone to sit down. I was thinking there had to be more to the story, and drove up to the Beckheim Resort. Joe was kind enough to talk to me. You should listen to what he has to say, honey. I think this is all a misunderstanding, but you should make up your own mind. After you hear Joe out. Will you do that for me? Aunt Doris asked. Sarah crossed her arms and nodded. She would listen because Aunt Doris asked, but that was it. I put a lot of pressure on Ryan last year to get settled down. I'm an old man and I don't like the idea of leaving Ryan on his own. He was an only child and his father was as well. Since the plane crash it's been just the two of us. 
Sarah looked up at Ryan's grandfather and nodded. I don't have much family either. Aunt Doris and her mother were it. The boy needed a little push to get serious about finding someone to share his life with. He hasn't let anyone close since he lost his parents. That's why I added an inheritance clause to the contract. Ryan will take over the business regardless, and he knows this. We had a long discussion about it over lunch a few days ago. I can't tell you how sorry I am that I caused this rift between the two of you. It wasn't my intention and I hope you can forgive me. Aunt Doris looked at her and took her hand. Sarah, Ryan looked heartbroken. He has no idea why you left yesterday or what this is about. He isn't acting like a man who only used you to further his career. Don't you think you owe it to yourself and baby Charlie to try to work this out? Joe and I both think that Ryan loves you, and it's obvious that you care for him too. Don't risk losing it over a misunderstanding. Her aunt's voice was gentle, but the words hurt. The two of them were ganging up on her. Sarah felt confused and the tiniest bit hopeful. Could they be right? I don't know. It's a lot to take in all at once. I need some time to think. Sarah rose and went back inside to make sense of everything that had happened in the past few days. Chapter 9 Aunt Doris? Sarah cautiously knocked on her great aunt's door. It was three in the morning, and she'd woken up an hour earlier with an aching back followed by a contraction. By now she was fairly certain that she was going into labor. The contractions were getting stronger and more regular than the Braxton Hicks ones she'd experienced on and off for the past week or two. Come in. Is everything okay? Her great aunt asked sleepily. I think I'm going into labor, Sarah said before gripping the side of the dresser as another wave of pain washed over her. Aunt Doris was up and by her side in moments. That definitely looks like labor. Take a deep breath and try to relax. Let your body do the work. The soothing voice calmed Sarah down, and a moment later the contraction was over. Aunt Doris glanced at her watch before putting on a dressing gown. Let's see how far apart your contractions are. Sarah nodded, grateful to have her great aunt by her side. They spent the next few hours walking up and down the hall, through the kitchen and into the living room, pausing when the contractions hit. They were becoming stronger and started coming closer together. Aunt Doris was taking note of the time in between and insisted it was still too early to go to the hospital. Sarah walked as much as she could, taking short breaks here and there to rest. To her surprise, Aunt Doris was an excellent birth coach, helping her focus her breathing and taking her mind off the pain and the worry. I'm glad you're here to help me through this, she said during one of those breaks. I'm happy to help. I was there when your mom went into labor with you. I remember it like it was yesterday. And here you are, about to welcome your own baby into the world. Aunt Doris smiled at her encouragingly. I had no idea. Mom never talked much about that time. Are you sure you don't want to call her? She could be down here in a couple of hours. It wasn't the first time Aunt Doris suggested she call her mother. There's no need to worry her. I'll call her after the baby is born and she can decide if she wants to be part of Charlie's life or not. Sarah didn't look forward to talking to her mother now that Ryan was out of the picture. I told you so was the last thing she needed to hear right now. Memories of attending birthing classes with Ryan and watching him put together the baby's crib flooded her mind. She shook her head, trying to dispel the thoughts, but the image of Ryan standing at the door holding his old teddy bear out to her stayed. She'd shoved the bear to the back of her closet after she'd come across the contract. On a whim, she walked to her room and added the small stuffed animal to her hospital bag. It's time, Aunt Dora said as she looked up from her watch. Your contractions are coming closer together, and from the look on your face, they are getting much stronger. Sarah caught her breath and nodded. I think I'm ready for some painkillers. I'm not sure I can take much more. The last two contractions had been much stronger than the ones that had awakened her hours earlier. She'd been ready to go to the hospital then, but Aunt Doris had encouraged her to labor at home for a few hours. 
They had spent much of the night pacing back and forth through the living room. Did you call Ryan? Aunt Doris asked after Sarah called Dr. Martin to let her know she was in labor and heading to the hospital. Sarah shook her head and walked out of the room. She wasn't ready to face him and find out once and for all if he was only interested in her and Charlie because of that stupid contract, or if his grandfather and her great-aunt were right. She had a few minutes, before the next contraction, to grab her bag. She put the last of her toiletries in the overnight bag and headed back out of her room. Her great-aunt was hanging up the phone in the kitchen when she walked in. Ready to go? Aunt Doris asked. Three contractions later, they were at the hospital. Sarah was glad her water hadn't broken in the car. A nurse rushed over with a wheelchair to escort her to one of the birthing suites. I'm Emily and I'll be here until 8 tonight, she said after getting Sarah settled in. I'll go find Dr. Martin. She will examine you and we'll come up with a plan from there. Go ahead and change into a gown. Get comfortable, I think we're going to be here for a few hours. She rushed out of the door, leaving Sarah and Aunt Doris in the room. Sarah looked around. The birthing suite was spacious, with large windows and a comfortable hospital bed. A sofa and wide chairs were grouped around a coffee table in one corner of the room. Sarah walked over to the bathroom to change into a hospital gown. She was surprised to find not only a large shower in the room, but also a big soaking tub. The tub must be for water births, Sarah decided. Do you think it would be okay for me to take a shower? Sarah asked. I don't see why not. Leave the door cracked and call me if you need me, Aunt Dora said. The hot water helped her relax, and it eased her sore muscles. She made it through another contraction while holding onto the bars built into the walls of the large walk-in shower. As soon as it waned, Sarah stepped out, dried off, and dressed in the hospital gown and the fluffy white bathrobe Aunt Doris had insisted on buying for her. She heard voices before she walked back into the main room. She should be out any moment. Take a seat, it's going to be a long day, Sarah heard Aunt Doris say. How is she? Ryan asked. Sarah's breath caught in her throat. What was he doing here, and how did he know she'd gone into labor? Aunt Doris must have called him, she realized. Sarah took a steady breath and decided to walk in and deal with him before the next contraction. Talk to him, Aunt Doris said. I'm going to grab some coffee. I won't be far if you need me. Sarah looked at Ryan after the door closed behind her aunt, not sure what to say. Grandpa Joe told me what happened and that you needed some time, Ryan said. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about the contract. It was such a non-issue, it didn't even occur to me. He was looking at her with sincerity in his eyes. Sarah wanted to believe him. But could she risk it? Your grandfather came by and explained what happened. The next contraction started and Sarah stumbled to the chair for something to hold on to. Before she could reach it, Ryan was at her side, steadying her. Breathe through the pain, he said, while using his hand to knead the muscles of her lower back. He remembered everything they had learned in their birth preparation class. Sarah's eyes filled with tears and it wasn't because of the increasingly stronger pain. Thank you, that helps, she grit out between clenched teeth. Any changes to the birth plan? Ryan asked. The pain was waning and Sarah laughed wryly. I'm starting to reconsider the whole natural birth idea. Painkillers are looking better and better. Ryan guided her to the couch to allow her to sit and rest long enough to catch her breath. Anita talked about this, remember. The birth plan is flexible. We can try some of the techniques to ease your pain naturally, if you'd like. Or I can get the nurse and we'll ask about those pain meds. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind, Ryan said. I'm glad you're here. I don't want to do this alone, she admitted, looking at her bare toe sticking out of the plastic slippers the hospital had provided her with. Good. I would like to be here for you and Charlie, if that's okay. We can figure out everything else later, he said. Sarah looked up and saw his open and honest smile. It gave her courage. I want to keep trying for a natural childbirth, she said. 
The door opened and Dr. Martin walked in with Nurse Emily. Let's check you and see how far you're dilated, the doctor said. Ryan helped Sarah to the bed, stopping when another contraction started. Dr. Martin and the nurse exchanged a serious look, but didn't say a word. Do you want me to leave? Ryan asked. Sarah shook her head and clutched his hand more tightly. The contractions were becoming increasingly stronger and closer together. She was scared and wanted him close. Sarah lay down on the hospital bed with Ryan standing by her shoulder, continuing to hold her hand while Dr. Martin gently examined her. You're already dilated to 8 centimeters. Not much longer and you'll be ready to push. I think you'll have the baby before lunch. Dr. Martin smiled at her encouragingly. We still have time to administer an epidural, but that window is quickly closing. Once you start to push, there isn't anything we can give you to help manage the pain. Sarah looked at Ryan, and his presence gave her the strength to stick to her plan. I can do this, she said to the doctor. No pain meds. Dr. Martin left to check on another patient, promising to return shortly. Emily stayed in the room with them, wiping Sarah's brow and offering her ice chips as the contractions started coming closer and closer together. The next hour passed in a blur. At some point, Aunt Doris poked her head in the door to let them know that she would be in the waiting room keeping Grandpa Joe company. I called him on my way over here, Ryan admitted. Sarah nodded and grabbed the bed rail as the next contraction started. The pain and pressure took her breath away. It was all she could do to suppress the urge to start pushing. You're fully dilated, Dr. Martin declared the next time she stopped by to check on Sarah. It's time to push. Sarah's eyes searched for Ryan. Their gazes locked and he nodded at her encouragingly. She could feel his strength and support flowing into her through their clasped hands. You can do this, he said and Sarah knew that the contract didn't matter. She didn't care that this baby may or may not help him gain control over the family company and fortune. He was here for her and the baby, and that was the only thing that was important. I'm sorry I left and ghosted you, she grunted out as the next contraction hit. Push, Dr. Martin ordered. Sarah pushed and Ryan squeezed her hand, reminding her to focus on putting all her power and energy into the task. By the time Charlie was born and the nurse had put him on her chest, both of them were worn out. Emily assured them that it had been a quick and easy labor, but nothing about this experience felt easy to Sarah. Her eyes met Ryan's, and she knew that they were in this together. They were family. He's perfect, Sarah said quietly. Her son was resting in her arms. She looked at Ryan, who couldn't keep his eyes off his son. You are amazing, he told her. He bent down to kiss her forehead and then that of their baby boy. Both their heads rose in unison when they heard a knock on the door. Aunt Doris poked her head in. May we come in, she asked. Who's we? Ryan asked. His grandfather poked his head around Aunt Doris. Just the two of us, Grandpa Joe said. We were hoping to see the newest addition to the Beckheim family. Come on in, Sarah said, cradling her son and catching a whiff of that sweet baby smell. The nurses had bathed and dressed Charlie before handing him back to her. She was tired and sore from the labor, but too excited and wound up to rest. Aunt Doris walked in carrying a large It's a Boy balloon and a white teddy bear wearing a Palmer Island t-shirt. Grandpa Joe followed a step behind her with flowers and gift bags. Did you buy out the gift shop? Ryan asked. Pretty much, Grandpa Joe replied, a large smile on his face. Can you blame us? We got a little excited at the news that baby Charlie was born and had to kill some time. Sarah could imagine Aunt Doris and Grandpa Joe wreaking havoc in the small store in the hospital lobby. Let's see what you got, she said, cradling Charlie closer. Ryan had gotten it right. From the look of it, the two of them had bought at least one of everything the small shop had to offer, including a onesie that matched the teddy bear's shirt. Let me hold that great-grandson of mine, Grandpa Joe demanded a short while later. Sarah hugged Charlie a little tighter. I'll handle it, Ryan whispered, too soft for his grandfather to hear, before turning to address the older man. 
It's fine. Sarah put her hand on Ryan's arm before he could get up. Of course you can, she said a little louder to Joe. Grandpa Joe walked over and carefully lifted Charlie from her arms. He expertly cradled the infant to his chest, supporting the small head with his right hand. He walked over to the seating area and sat down. Sarah saw his lips move, but he was speaking too softly for her to make out the words. How are you feeling? Aunt Doris asked, brushing a few stray hairs from Sarah's face. Happy, Sarah said, and she relaxed into the cushions. Ryan took a deep breath and looked around the hospital room. They were alone. Aunt Doris and his grandfather had left in the late afternoon to get some much-deserved rest. Sarah was finally napping as well. Watching her go through the pain and agony of labor had been one of the hardest things he'd experienced. He didn't like seeing her beautiful face contorted during those last few contractions. At the same time, he was incredibly proud of her. She'd done it. She'd stuck to their birth plan and had given birth to their son without painkillers or epidurals. He held Charlie, watching his son breathe softly as he slept in his arms. Ryan couldn't believe the baby boy was here. He was a father. The past few hours had gone by quickly, and the experience of watching his son being born hadn't quite sunk in yet. They were parents, in charge of raising this tiny human being. A few months ago, the idea of raising a family would have scared the wits out of him. Now he couldn't imagine anything better. Charlie's eyes started to flutter and his tiny mouth opened, forming an O. He looked surprised to see Ryan. Hey there. I'm your dad. Ryan liked the sound of that. He stood and started gently rocking his son. You're probably getting hungry again. Hang in there. Let's try to give your mom a few more minutes of sleep. Charlie closed his little mouth as if to agree and looked at him a moment longer before shutting his eyes. Ryan soaked up the peacefulness of the moment, standing here in the soft afternoon light, holding his son and looking at the woman he loved sleeping in the large hospital bed. It was a moment he would never forget. It was a moment that didn't last. Sarah woke as soon as Charlie started to cry. He handed the baby to her and watched her nurse. He had been right. Sarah was a wonderful mother and had nursed without a problem from the start. From everything he'd read these past few weeks, that wasn't as common as one would think. It didn't take long to feed Charlie, and after a quick diaper change, he was resting comfortably in the small crib next to Sarah's bed. Ryan walked over to the chair that had his jacket slung over the back and dug around in the pocket until he found the small box he'd tucked in there when leaving for the hospital. He stood there, holding the box in his hand, and suddenly was unsure this was the time and place for what he had planned. Everything okay? Sarah asked. She was sitting up in bed, smiling at him. That's when he knew. It didn't matter that they were in a hospital room or that they were both exhausted. He strode over to her and got down on one knee. He opened the small box covered in dark blue velvet and held it up to her, watching her face. He had spent the past weeks imagining this moment. He'd come up with grand speeches and plenty of reasons why she should agree to become his wife. Why couldn't he remember any of it? Marry me, was all he could get out, emotion choking his voice. Ryan held his breath and kept looking at her. Sarah looked stunned for a moment. Then the most brilliant smile spread across her face. Yes. Yes, he asked, needing to confirm that he'd heard her right. Yes, I'll marry you. She reached for him, drawing him up off his knees and next to her. The ring was forgotten when he took her face in his hands. He looked at her for a moment, felt the breath coming in and out of her mouth half a dozen times before closing the last bit of distance between them and touching his lips to hers. He kissed her gently, reverently, aware of everything she'd gone through today. Sarah was having none of that. She clung to his lips, demanding more, running her fingers through his hair and grabbing hold. Ryan chuckled when he realized he'd underestimated her. She wasn't a delicate flower who needed to recover for the agony of childbirth. She was fierce and passionate. He was happy to obey her silent demand. They pulled apart a few minutes later, both a little breathless. 
Are you sure? You'll marry me? He had to ask one more time. Sarah nodded. Tomorrow? He was pushing his luck. He hoped she didn't want a big wedding that would take months to plan. Ryan wanted, no he needed her to be his, as soon as possible. Sarah looked surprised. She seemed to contemplate the idea for a moment. Tomorrow is Christmas Day, she said. She was right. In all the excitement, he'd forgotten that this was Christmas Eve. I'd love to be a Christmas bride. Sarah smiled, then started to look over the bedspread. The ring. He noticed a bit of panic in her voice and realized that they'd both forgotten about the small box that held his grandmother's engagement ring. He dug through the covers and found the box. It had closed and when he opened it back up, he was relieved to find the small piece of jewelry still sitting inside. He pulled it out and looked at Sarah. She held out her left hand and he slid the diamond ring onto her finger. Ryan walked over to the crib and picked up his son, careful not to wake the sleeping infant. He returned to the bed and stretched out next to her. Cradling Charlie in one arm and holding Sarah next to him with the other, he felt complete. Complete and happier than he could remember ever being. They were his family, and tomorrow, they would make it official. Epilogue Christmas Day Sarah stood in the middle of the hospital room where she'd given birth the day before. Ready to go? Ryan asked. It was mid-morning and Dr. Martin had given them the all-clear to leave. Sarah looked around the room to make sure she didn't leave anything. I'm a little nervous, she admitted. The thought of leaving the comfort of having a nurse there to answer questions and help with Charlie was a bit overwhelming. Sarah walked over to the infant car seat Ryan had retrieved from Aunt Doris's house earlier and buckled her son in. She was sore from the labor, but a hot shower and clean clothes had done wonders to revive her. She could do this. And she wouldn't be alone. Aunt Doris was waiting at the house and her mom was on her way from North Carolina. They'd talked on the phone last night after Charlie's birth. It had taken both Sarah and Aunt Doris to talk Marianne out of getting on the road late last night. Marianne had left early this morning instead and had stopped by the hospital for a little while before heading to Aunt Doris's. Her mother had been excited to meet her grandson and it meant the world to Sarah. Most importantly, she had Ryan by her side. She wasn't raising Charlie on her own. He'd grow up with a mother and a father. Getting cold feet? Ryan teased. Not about marrying you. Sarah smiled and gave him a quick kiss. About keeping this tiny baby of ours alive. Now that she said it out loud, it sounded ridiculous. Women gave birth every day and figured out how to feed, diaper, and bathe their infants. She could handle this. She straightened up, squared her shoulders and walked out to the car. Ryan was by her side, carrying Charlie in his car seat. She was ready to go home and marry the man with the stunning brown-green eyes she'd fallen for a little over nine months ago, on a sandy beach in Aruba. A few hours later, Sarah stepped out on the deck, Charlie in her arms. Somehow, her mother and Aunt Doris had pulled together a cake, a dress, and a few simple decorations. They turned the back deck into a stunning Christmas scene with two small decorated Christmas trees, garlands wrapped around the porch railings, and poinsettias forming a small path to lead up to the spot where Ryan and the preacher waited for her. Grandpa Joe had pulled a few strings to get their marriage license pushed through in record time, and Aunt Doris had called in a favor with the preacher of her church. They'd worked a small miracle to make this Christmas wedding happen, and Sarah was grateful. The ceremony was a simple affair. As per their wishes, it was short and sweet. Still sore and tired from the birth, it was all Sarah could handle. I do. Ryan's face was just a few inches from hers, and he was beaming as he uttered the words. It took every ounce of Sarah's willpower to turn her gaze to the preacher when it was her turn to answer. I do, she heard herself say before Ryan slipped the small gold band on her finger and kissed her. Congratulations, to both of you. Aunt Doris rushed over and handed baby Charlie back to her. Sarah was in a daze. Twenty-four hours ago she was in the hospital giving birth to her son. 
And here she was, standing on the back deck of her gray tant's house overlooking the ocean, and holding the hand of her husband. It felt surreal and perfect at the same time. She had a feeling it would take her a little while to come to terms with the fact that she'd become a mother and a wife in less than a day. May I kiss the bride? Grandpa Joe asked, before placing a gentle kiss on her cheek. Welcome to the family, he told Sarah, before turning to Ryan, to pat him on the shoulder. You've done well. I'm proud of you, and your parents would be as well. Sarah could tell the words meant the world to her new husband. She squeezed Ryan's hand in silent support. Charlie started to squirm in her arms. She rocked him, hoping for a few more minutes before he was ready to eat. Her mother stood close to the porch door, looking a bit lost. She'd arrived late last night after a call from Aunt Doris and had been to the hospital early this morning before they were discharged. In the excitement of bringing home a new baby and setting up an impromptu wedding, there hadn't been much time to talk. Sarah walked up to her mother. I'm glad you're here, she said over Charlie's first few cries. I wouldn't have missed it for the world, Marianne replied, tears glistening in the corners of her eyes. You're going to be a wonderful mother to Charlie. I'm sorry, I ever doubted that, and I never should have kicked you out. I misjudged you and Ryan both. I hope one day, you'll be able to forgive me for that. I do, Sarah said for the second time, and with just as much conviction as the first time around. I love you mom and I would love to have you in our lives. Charlie is going to need a grandma. May I? Marianne asked and Sarah handed her the baby. He looks just like you did when you were born. Her mother's voice was full of emotion. I can't wait to watch him grow up. I'm going to spoil this little boy rotten. Speaking of which, I bought him a few gifts. Marianne pointed to a stack of presents sitting on the porch table that had been pushed into a corner. Let's have some cake and then we can open presents, Aunt Doris suggested. Grandpa Joe insisted Ryan and Sarah cut the cake. He and Marianne kept getting in each other's way, trying to take pictures, while Aunt Doris left to change baby Charlie. Sarah followed her a few minutes later and found them rocking in one of the old wooden chairs in the sunroom off the kitchen. He's hungry, Aunt Doris observed, looking at the small boy eagerly sucking on her knuckle. I thought he might be, Sarah replied before taking him and settling in to nurse. Have I told you how proud I am of you? Aunt Doris asked. Sarah could feel her great-aunt looking at her and Charlie. The past six months haven't been easy for you, but look at you now. I don't think I've ever seen you this happy. I couldn't have done it without you, Aunt Doris. The two women sat in silence, rocking away while Charlie nursed. Am I interrupting? Ryan asked when he walked out on the porch a little while later. Not at all, Aunt Doris replied while getting up from her rocker. I better go check on Marianne and Joe. Come back out when you're ready, and we'll open presents. With that she walked back into the house. A few moments later, Sarah heard the door to the back deck open and close. She rose from her chair and put Charlie on her shoulder to burp him. Ryan walked up behind her and put his arms around her. I have a surprise present for the two of you. He sounded nervous. Sarah wished she could see his face. She held her breath, waiting for him to continue. Do you remember the house we looked at on the beach? The one surrounded by trees? How could she forget? It had been her favorite out of everything they'd looked at when Ryan had insisted they start house hunting together. She nodded. I bought it. For us. Sarah was too stunned to say anything. We can sell it. It's not a problem. I thought you liked it and I wanted us to have a place of our own, dash. Sarah turned around and put her left hand on his chest to stop him. Charlie was safely cradled in her right arm. Thank you. I love that house. I couldn't think of a better Christmas present. Ryan let out a deep breath. Relief washed over his handsome face. Sarah smiled. Good. I love the house too. We won't be able to move in until the first of the year, though. Sarah laughed. That's a good thing. 
I don't think I could handle moving this week. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, hasn't it? I can't believe it's only been a month since I bumped into you on Main Street. Ryan reached up and cradled her face in his hands. I'm glad I did. I can't imagine a life without you and Charlie in it. Neither can I, Sarah said. She couldn't wait to see where the next few months of their life together would take them. Her new husband was full of surprises. Life with Ryan would always be an adventure and she didn't want it any other way. Merry Christmas, he mumbled before lowering his head to kiss her. The End This has been an air for Christmas. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2019 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.